Okay. So Willie, first of all, thank you for taking your time for this interview. It really means a lot. And my, my pleasure. <laughs> I, and so the first question is gonna be pretty basic, but you know, like so how long have you worked at Otterbein? Um Gosh, I came on board at Otterbein in 1983, so I am approaching that 40-year anniversary. Kind of hard to believe. Oh, wow. So a lot can happen over 40 years. Have you noticed any, you know, difference of how much <laughs> has changed at, at the institution in of itself? Absolutely. Uh, lots of things have changed. Um, it's kind of hard to give a short elevator response to that, so I won't attempt. Uh, instead, I will say that the student population has grown. You know, as we approach our uh, commencement exercises or spring commencement, I'm reminded of that growth in student graduates. Uh, we certainly had those commencement exercises held in the Reich Center. At that time, the entire graduating class faculty included um, and their guests we're all seated comfortably in the Reich Center. We pull the curtains shut across the basketball floor, and it was a wonderful celebration of their scholastic achievement. Uh, as we look at commencement now, we actually have to add hundreds of chairs to the floor and extend another set of bleachers out well beyond the curtain to hold all of those individuals that now make up the commencement graduating class. Uh, so that alone has changed. Thinking about the geography of the campus, uh, certainly I've seen new buildings come online that's been exciting to go from uh, open green spaces to footers being dug and all of a sudden over time seeing buildings begin to take shape on campus. Those buildings then populate with either students or they become admin offices. Uh, so Westerville in itself has seen a, a growth of Otterbein University. And, uh, and for me, it's been great being a part of that growth. Wow, so what are some of the roles that you've had at Otterbein over the years then? Um, I jokingly, <laughs> I jokingly called myself or to re refer to myself as a chief chaos control officer. <laughs> um, and that was because of uh, how disruptive technology malfunctions can be to, to anyone's day. But as I think back uh, to the positions held, Coming in the door at the entry level as an AV technician was uh, an absolute joy uh, because truly I had hands on any and everything that the campus had in its arsenal of AV equipment uh, that was used to teach faculty, that were used to teach students, that were used to entertain guests. Uh, so that was um, a, an, an interesting time because you, you really got to know the hardware intimately. And, and I phrase it that way because when we think about technology now, we're, we're more consumers. We touch buttons and interact with devices. When I started, you really had to get to know the device in order to operate it. I mean, it was beyond just a simple button. Um, I won't get into all the technical details there. I'll instead focus on the various roles. So uh, again, starting, uh, with the entry level role of a uh, AV technician was uh, skill sets or skill demands number one. That position grew uh, as we start to take on more staff within the department. Uh, that department was located in the lower level of the library. And at the time it was the Learning Resource Center. Uh, as our staff grew and my role grew, more individuals who did what I do came on board kind of hard to verbalize that sentence for some reason this time of day. Um, so I then migrated into a leadership role as associate director of the department and eventually became the department director. And at that time, uh, evolution of technology was starting to really take a good strong uh, hold on Otterbein's campus. And we transitioned from the Learning Resource Center to Instructional Media Center, uh, focusing more on instruction and not so much on equipment per se. Um, time goes on, 
and we began seeing a lot of our devices, new devices that are coming in the door that were almost computers that look like AV equipment. Um, eventually, uh, my unit was then moved over to Roush Hall to join forces with information technology. Uh, that department was renamed Information and Technology Services. So it combined the world of AV and IT very effectively. Um, still the director, my role was still uh, the director of uh, Instructional Support Services. It eventually transitioned to Senior Technology Specialist within the Office of Information and Technology Services. So uh, I've seen a number of hats uh, on campus and certainly a number of departments that I've worked within on campus. So I like what you said about like getting to know the technology. Uh, it reminds me of an interview that I saw uh, that you did with Tim Albright discussing the importance of emotional intelligence. And of course, like a human and a machine are <laughs> two different things, but still, um, the the process of getting to know something instead of you ask a question get an answer or make a cause you expect the effect immediately Absolutely. so Absolutely. like i'm sure a lot of people have a pretty vague uh conception of what emotional intelligence is so can you describe like, what it means to you um and I'm trying to avoid the textbook answer. So I'll say what it means to me is just being keenly aware of how my actions impact the well-being of others. Um, and, and I'll explain that in, 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 in this detail. Uh, part of my uh, previous roles here at the university would be classroom design and indeed performance space design. When we think about spaces such as the Clements Recreation Center or the library, Roush Hall, the point, uh, to sit down and meet with architects and to sit down and meet with faculty and indeed students can be very informative. Where the emotional intelligence comes in is really hearing that individual's need, right, of how they'll live and work within the space. You know, it's easy to buy furniture and put it within a, a classroom environment or add lighting fixtures to a classroom or projection technologies in a screen. It's a whole different science, if you will, to understand how people interact with those devices and what they hope to achieve uh, within those spaces. Uh, for instance, if, if we were to take um, uh, athletics or health and sports sciences, right, uh, faculty teaching in a classroom can have very different demands spatially of that classroom that someone, say, teaching English would have if the classrooms have the exact same physical dimensions. For English, um, and, and this is me guesstimating, so I don't have uh, the specialty in pedagogy, right? Uh, but for English, you can conceive a faculty, kind of the, uh, the sage on the stage, uh, going over literature, students uh, sharing passages uh, from a variety of different works, uh, maybe discussion taking place amongst students if there were like breakout uh, sessions that were happening within that classroom environment. You go forward or clear that room and now you bring in a group from health and sports sciences. You may still have the sage on the stage, in other words, the subject matter expert, i.e. the faculty, but now there's likely a need for demonstration area. So if you're studying physiology uh, of, of athleticism, um, you, certainly you can talk about that from a textbook standpoint but often you're going to need to demonstrate what it means from a physical stance standpoint, from a muscular skeletal standpoint. So you're looking at areas where you have to address usable space. You know, do the desk moves, do the chairs move, or they easily slid out of the way. Is there an abundance of demonstration space there? If you bo push both of those curriculums out of the way, and now you bring in an art class, right? And you're studying art and you're going over this granular detail about what's projected on that screen. So now you're, you're really honed in on the visual aspects of it, 
So the geography of the classroom may not be as important. In other words, you may not need group breakout or demonstration areas, but what you need are keen visual components within that classroom. You need the opportunity to control lighting in various zones. So you're not washing out classroom content. You need higher resolution projectors and screens that offer greater gain or reflected light values coming off the screen that impacts the eyes so that that detail of the image renders a lot clearer. Um, so again, when I'm choosing products, when I'm working with the, I don't want to say clients, when I'm working with the campus population, I make certain that I'm listening to their needs. Because um, at the end of the day, really, all of our work needs to be brand agnostic. It doesn't matter XYZ brand that you're putting in. What really matters is how well is it working and how well is it meeting the needs of those who are really relying on it. And it needs to be user friendly as well. I do want to throw that in. I like that. Uh, I also uh, liked uh, from your interview with Tim, you said that failure is an event. And I think that is a very, very important philosophy of life. And I was wondering if you have any more philosophies like that. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, they, they happen with some sense of spontaneity <laughs> <laughs> when philosophies uh, come forward. And yeah, and, and failure is definitely an event and, and not a person. And that's something that I try to share with people. Um, you know, in life, we are presented with a variety of learning opportunities. Um, and we never know when that learning opportunity is going to occur. You know, jokingly, uh, I've been known to say that equipment never fails, right? Instead, there are, how did I best phrase it? Um, there are undocumented features that we're sometimes treated to. Uh, so it's not so much an equipment failure. So it's really about how you frame that experience. You know, you, you can have an incident wreck your day, or it can give you an opportunity to learn more about how you deal with the unexpected, uh, because they happen every single day. Uh, I know they do with me. Uh, one example would be a conference at The Point. Uh, this was about three, maybe four weeks ago. And uh, I won't mention the client, but they had a great crowd. So imagine everyone's gathering, they're excited, all the energy's in the room, every presenter's got their presentation, they test run it, the audio is set, and then the building goes completely dark. And I know there's nothing I can do about that from a power standpoint going into the building. Uh, at least there's nothing I can do to turn it back on, but I do know that I have contact information for those who have access to the infrastructure. So I start by, of course, contacting our police department, not because it's a life safety emergency, but I know those individuals have access to the campus network of security cameras. So by looking at those camera feeds, they can immediately determine whether or not the power outage is isolated to the building that I'm in, or whether it's broader to campus, uh, i.e. a larger Westerville issue. Uh, once we determine in talking with them that it was isolated to just the building I was in, then I move on to our facilities group, uh, sharing with them the power outage situation. Uh, they then check the grid and realize that it's not within the building, but it's actually outside of the building. And they immediately contacted uh, the city of Westerville. So in a short time interval of making those calls and contacting the right offices, um, I then see a couple of trucks from the city of Westerville pull up and they reestablish the circuit breaker on one of the, you, uh, one of the utility poles uh, near the building. And that got powered back up. We were up and running. Uh, so again, um, it was a learning opportunity, right, for me. Uh, and it was one of those things of recognizing that it wasn't a failure because even though those individuals were prepared with their presentations and they had that glitch, they still had the opportunity to address the crowd that was gathered. Uh, and they could step down from the stage and do so in more of an intimate manner instead of being at the stage um, talking through the microphone. Um, so it's really about adaptability in, in some instances. And um, that was one of the, I think the joys seeing a group of professionals who really 
kept their professional caps on and kept moving forward. And then when power was reestablished, uh, we just picked up where we left off. <laughs> wow, that is very, very interesting. <laughs> Uh, so what made you want to pursue a career in technical services? I am wired that way. Um, <laughs> no, uh, truly, I have a curious mind about how things work. And um, as a kid, um, uh, you know, I feel comfortable saying I got my butt spanked a lot. Um, <laughs> because I took apart a lot of things in the household and I oh. did it frequently. Uh, my toys did not last long because the curious mind had to know exactly what was inside, how it operated and why it did what it did when I pushed certain buttons or why it didn't do what I wanted it to do when I was confident that I changed it or modified it to do step X. Uh, so all that aside, uh, it was... I guess really evident that I had this desire for the electromechanical world. And, and really that's where the passion uh, comes from. Uh, I consider myself a, um, I've heard it described, not me, but I've heard the term fortunate deviant described. Uh, when I first heard it, 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 I didn't like the sound of it, I'll be honest. Uh, but as it was explained, the fortunate deviant is the one that deviates from the norm and the norm in my case was kind of despair and loss so for me i excelled because i always asked why i always asked you know why was the sky blue why is the grass green and i know maybe many kids ask that question but i truly needed to know and for someone to say well that's the way god made it while I heard them, I couldn't accept that as the end all. There still had to be an underlying reason. So to gain an understanding of moisture vapors in the air and molecules of light or bands of light, visible light, processing through those molecules, the prisms, the, I mean, there's so much to this incredible world. Um, it's hard not to be entertained. And much like I've shared with students, if you're bored, it's because you're not looking beyond the surface level. So how would that relate to your philosophy that failure is an event and not a person or any other life philosophies that you have or continue to, to foster? Yep, failure is an event and not a person. Um, how does that relate? Well, Gosh, I'm trying to give some practical examples of that. And, and I think for me, it would be uh, sitting down in the aftermath of, let's say, an event. And for the person hosting the event, they felt it was a failure. They felt perhaps they were a failure because the sound didn't come through as cleanly as they would like or as loud as they would like or the graphics didn't show on screen as brightly or as colorful as they would like. And I basically explained to them what happened during the event, you know, what went wrong during the event, not so much what they did wrong. Um, one clear example would be sitting down with a colleague recently as they were looking at the graphics on their screen uh, for a PowerPoint presentation that they completed. And I said, well, have you tried it in the classroom? I said, no, it looks good here. I said, well, the resolution, the color rendering on your computer monitor is very different than that from a projector. You know, that projector is projecting light onto a screen. The screen's reflecting it back to the eye. There are a lot of dynamics happening there. Uh, when they tested it, they found out that visually, there was far less impact to their graphic on the screen than it was on their monitor. Uh, so it's giving, I think, our, ourselves the opportunity to experience life in order to recognize the areas in which we can grow. So again, uh, it's not so much failure of a person, but it is truly an event. I hope that kind of better explains that aspect of the philosophy? Oh, yes, it, it does. So when it 
came to achieving your goals, you know, growing up, you were, you were different. You were very techie based, uh, the fortunate deviant, which I, I, I actually like that. It's, it's very, <laughs> it, it makes a lot of sense. So how has the factor of race affected you when it came to achieving it? And you don't have to answer if you're uncomfortable with this. I, I am question. comfortable with pretty much everything I experience in life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, for, for me, race has, has definitely, I wouldn't say it's been a challenge, but it's been, um, it's not even an obstacle. Uh, I won't allow it to be an obstacle. I do recognize that there are challenges, societal challenges, right? Uh, so here I am, a man of color entering the arena of technology. Right. So as I walk into those spaces, whether I'm attending a conference, whether I'm walking into a classroom, even shopping uh, in a technology store, something along that line. Right. The clientele, a lot of the clientele does not look like me. The employees do not do not look like me. Um, going into that conference environment, many of the patrons throughout there do not look like me. If I have the opportunity to visit uh, a factory where the technology is being created or designed, a lot of the staff, the employees, the engineers do not look like me. So I, for me, I, I don't allow those differences to be barriers to my success and getting out and doing what I desire to do. But I also recognize that for some, it's a barrier for them as far as their honest and open communication with me. Uh, in other words, um, as I enter into that space and that person recognizes that I am a different color than they are, a different ethnicity than they are, that's what they see predominantly. What I see is a technology opportunity, right? So what they should be seeing is a technology conversation opportunity, a technology sales opportunity, a technology mentoring opportunity, a technology information, information exchange opportunity. Um, so I fully recognize how ethnicity, race, and even gender factors into how we interact with people around us. Uh, but it need not be a hindrance. Uh, one other chunk of philosophy, difference does not mean deficient. And that's one of the things I try to get across to people. It is completely fine to be different. You know, we don't even think about it if we take a bite of an apple and then take a bite of an orange or a banana or grapes, all different. But we wouldn't say one is deficient, right? Mm -hmm. They're just different. The same thing about humans, the same thing about gender, the same thing about height, you know, mm -hmm. the same thing about curly hair, straight hair, different, not deficient. Mm -hmm. So what other advice would you give to uh, POC youth who want to pursue a career in tech services? Because as you said, it's a very narrow demographic mm -hmm. as of now. Um, my advice would be to be patient in your encounters with people. Um, now, I know I'll get some pushback from my colleagues, particularly those of color and, and those not, right? Mm -hmm. Because, well, there, there are two things. One, uh, as a person of color, and this is something that I've certainly talked about in circles of people of color and, um, and folks not of color, right? Um, there are times that you feel burdened by the notion of, of serving, serving as the educator, uh, you know, when, 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 it, when my um, white friends will ask me a question about the black experience, I have no problems with it. You know, uh, it's open, it's honest communication. And there are times that they will preface it by saying, well, I hope this doesn't make you mad, but I'd like to ask this question. And I immediately respond with, no, it doesn't make me mad, but I am disappointed that you feel that you needed to qualify because I'm honest with you and I hope you'll always be honest with me. The other piece of that is 
they're asking me to serve as a spokesperson for an entire race of people, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, not all women are like a monolith, right? Mm -hmm. Not all black males are like a monolith. I mean, we're all individuals. Uh, so there is that unfair weight through those interactions as, as we weight people of, of color. Uh, and I say that based upon my experience. So I have no scientific proof to say every single question is weighted along those lines. I only have my own experiences and shared experiences by people of color who can who can who have who have shared that uh, that same type of burden. So it's to kind of be patient as you interact and talk. Uh, don't let fear push you away from anything that looks attractive as far as a career. Um, anything you want to dive into, dive into. You know, just be you. Um, there are times where I, I think we all fall victim to the fact that we're human beings. And there are things that are ingrained in us as human beings, right? Um, for instance, the, the human brain always wants to solve puzzles. If you were standing um, outside in the library, at your car, wherever, and you heard a noise, you immediately, without even thinking about it, begin to solve what is that noise, right? You're going to turn and look. You're going to pause what you're doing. Your brain's asking, is there a threat there? Is that what the cause of the noise? I, I mean, it's, it's an automatic instinctive piece, right? Which also means as we encounter individuals who don't look like us, aren't sized like us, don't have the same speech cadence, maybe have an accent different to us, we want to solve that in some manner. And sometimes it, solving means shifting that person to a different category. That category could be cooperative or it could be combative. And that is one of the things, as I think about uh, anyone of color who's looking for a career in whatever, if you're going into an arena where you're representing a minority of people who look like you, there is that puzzle that unfortunately you have to help people solve because you know who you are. Mm -hmm. and what you have to offer and what you're bringing forward. And there are times you are kind of compelled to convince that person to recognize your difference, but not view your difference as a deficiency. Mm -hmm. So how would you handle, like, I'm going to call it like representative or educator burnout, because as you said, if you're the minority and no one else in your field looks like you and you you kind of expect you're expected to be that representative or people ask you hey is this okay did i offend you or how would you handle it so and on one hand it can be very appreciative but on the other hand it, it just gets so exhausting so how would you combat that? Yep, that's a very good question. Thank you for asking that. Um, at some point, you learn when to engage and when not to engage uh, so that fatigue isn't an issue. And, and there's some times that you have to learn um, <laughs> to pick your battles. Um, one example would be a gathering with friends uh, in the state of Pennsylvania. And uh, one of the persons uh, in the gathering says, gosh, I used to be a big fan of his, but when he starts speaking up on XYZ issue, I just start to dislike him. You know, I would just wish he'd shut up and play basketball. And, you know, and, and you know, there was the racial tone uh, to it, but there was also, how can I best phrase it? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll rephrase it. Or, or present the sentence a, a little bit differently as it's sp spooling around in my head. So I turned to this gentleman and who's part of the group 
And I said, you know, I, I hear what you're saying. It is disappointing because whether that person's a musician, athlete, movie star, I mean, we recognize them for that role. However, it's a job, right? Just like our jobs. And there's nothing about taking any of our jobs, and I point to everyone in the room, including myself, there's nothing about taking any of our jobs where we are mandated to give up our rights as American citizens. So regardless of what job we take, we can still speak out on issues we don't like. We can choose to paint our house a color that is appealing to us. We can drive any car that represents our ideals. You know, we can be full people. So we're not really beholden to that role to shape our absolute being. Um, you know, we can be entertainers, but we're still full people. So I hear you, you know, when you say, gosh, I wish they just focused on basketball because that's how we know that person. But they're a whole person, you know, and that person just happened, as we know, to be married and has a family, you know, so that person is a dad, you know, and, and is probably an uncle because they have siblings and probably shops at some of the same brand grocery stores that we shop at. So I took that piece of dialogue, that awkward exchange, and just encouraged the person to think a little broader about an individual versus holding them tight and say, this is the only value that you have to me. Um, and I can only hope that what he heard was conversation from me and not confrontation. Um, and, it, and it can be a bit complicated to get there with people. But it reminds me of something that someone shared with me many years ago, that when you experience someone saying something that really rubs you the wrong way, or you feel it's, um, I don't know, maybe oppressing the rights of another, instead of calling them out on it, uh, try calling them in, you know, try to have conversation instead of confrontation with them. You know, in other words, recognize what they're saying and ask for more, you know, ask them to explain why they feel that way without kind of pointing the finger of why did you say that? Now that's that's really good advice. I'm glad I'm glad you shared that. Um, so this question is more or less like from back to our earlier conversation, but so looking back on everything, how has your time at Otterbein impacted you? Hmm. It's made me crazy. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, since day one, uh, really since birth, I feel like uh, humor is uh, is a must for me, and and that hasn't changed throughout the uh, time here at Otterbein. Uh, as far as how it has affected me, the years at Otterbein, uh, I can I can truly say only positive. Uh, when I think about the opportunities that I've had to to work with and learn from the people around me, uh, the things I've been exposed to. It, they have really been tremendous. Uh, how it has impacted me, it's broadened my worldview. Um, there, is, there, there are lots of areas that I know nothing about, right? And mm -hmm. I think that's true of most of us. But there is seldom an area that I don't know who to ask about, if that makes any sense. And I remember talking with a librarian, this was years ago, and I used to enjoy a silly little game that I call Stump the Librarian, and I never won. Uh, <laughs> I'm still not bitter, I just never won. And it goes like this. Uh, let's say I had a question about flooding and Southern Ohio and why it's such a problem, right? And the librarian would provide an answer. <laughs> <laughs> or point me to a series of books where I could find the answer. So instead of just accepting or rationalizing that Southern Ohio is a bad place to live because it floods all the time, <laughs> the discussion would actually turn towards geography, right? Uh -uh. And it would turn towards the topographical maps 
So you start to see the lay of the land and the fact that water will always take the path of least resistance. And then you start to look beyond that and you look at city developments and you look at areas that used to be broad, huge green spaces, maybe farms that are now shopping malls, that are now housing developments. So when rain pours down, it hits those impermeable spaces. It runs into storm sewers. We all recognize that, but the water still has to go somewhere. So it hits the small streams and the creeks and the rivers. And since water always seeks the path of least resistance, it's gonna to go to the lower lying areas. And if that is 50, 60, 180 miles away, that's where it's gonna head. So that downpour of rain that, you know, 24 hours later, we're still doing fine here in Columbus, but in Southern Ohio, they're having flooding issues. And it's not directly because of what happened in Columbus, but it's all of the tri tributaries in the surrounding areas that contribute to the rising water levels elsewhere. And then you also have the permeability of ground of different areas of soil as well that factors into that. So um, being at Otterbein means that if you're standing still and not learning anything, apparently you're deceased. Um, <laughs> because there is always something to learn, always something to learn. Yeah, so uh, I guess that could lead to like how the library in of itself has impacted you because it's both um, its own thing, but it's also part of Otterbein. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, I don't wanna say it's at an odd limbo because it's its own identity, but, you know, <laughs> sorry, I'm lost for words. Oh, no, no. Um, the, the library, libraries in general are unique places. Um, they are, gosh, they're, they're like oases in the, in the desert. Um, one of the fond memories that I have is when our first library opened in my neighborhood, um, I was maybe 10 years old. I remember reading volumes of Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys. I don't know if I should even share that, uh, but <laughs> but it was it was like a double wide trailer with air conditioning. Uh, so one, it had air conditioning. I grew up in a house uh, on a dirt road, no air conditioning, uh, no screen door. So on the hottest days, you couldn't really open the door and get much ventilation because all kinds of bugs would fly in. But all that aside, to go into the space meant that I could go into a whole different world, right? So mm -hmm. regardless of what I had or didn't have at home, um, the library really didn't care where I came from, right? Because the books will never discriminate against you. You could walk in, grab any volume that you were interested in and just pour through it page after page you can ask questions of the librarian. Uh, you can get, be excited about something new that was coming in. You could travel well beyond the borders of your neighborhood and beyond the geography even of the US by just visiting the library. So just the wealth of opportunities that libraries in general provide to the entire world is just utterly amazing. And, and that's what the library has and continues to mean to me. And the fact that I started my professional career uh, seated within that environment uh, of the Courtright Memorial Library is uh, absolutely great because, again, I was a kid that always wanted to know why. <laughs> That's great. Um, so to end this interview on a very lighter note, uh, so we all just came back from a long weekend, a well-deserved long weekend. Um, and this also would relate to uh, how you said about this celebrity who's a whole person, not just someone we know as their job. So I was wondering if there are any personal interests or hobbies that you like to do outside of work. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> 24 seven, 365 days a year in my vehicle, unless I've, remove them for some reason are fishing poles. 
Uh, so I have my fishing gear with me at all times. Uh, there are many times that during my lunch hour, uh, I will fish instead of enjoying lunch. And that's my tranquility. Um, there are also binoculars in my vehicle and four birding books. I enjoy birding, uh, which I find to just be a delightful hobby and just looking at the nature of things. Um, other things would include uh, uh, cycling. I, I enjoy uh, getting on the bike and just kind of being a kid again, uh, traveling far faster than I can if I'm walking and having the opportunity to see things that I would typically miss if I'm in my vehicle because you're cognizant of the cars around you and traffic and such. On a bike, you're certainly cognizant of the cars around you and traffic, but at a slower pace, you can really take in all the nuances of the neighborhood, uh, the doors, the landscaping. Uh, people in general, uh, things of that nature. And because I have this passion for the physical world of how things work, I enjoy sports shooting. Um, that is, I don't know, it's just a joy of trying to understand the physics of, of ballistics, if you will, and how things interact with air around you. And, and even the deception of distance uh, particularly on a hot day versus a cold day. Uh, some of us have probably noticed on hot days, if you're looking down a piece of asphalt road, you see little heat vapors rising. Um, yeah, we don't really think about how it impacts the world around us, but it does tremendously. One example would be, and this kind of flips back to technology, <laughs> talking with a colleague in the field about sound system design. Uh, he and his company integrated the sound system at one of the major motor speedways. And he says, most people don't notice, but a lot of the speakers in the grandstand are actually facing downward towards the audience. And I said, hmm, why would you face them down? He says, well, heat rises, right? We all agree. So you have that hot track. And as those air molecules rise, they push the sound waves upward. So if you're oh. firing down sound gets pushed up and into the grandstand. If you aim it at the grandstand, you will lose so much volume because it began shooting right over people's head because their molecules are pushing it upward. You know, things like that that you just don't think about, but it makes the world exciting when you understand the physics of it and all the things are, that are at play around us all the time. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. I never thought of that. But so, well, again, thank you so much for taking your time for this interview. And so I guess that wraps everything up. So awesome. once again, it's been a pleasure for thank getting you. to know you and talking to you, Willie. Thank, well, you. thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to share. So thank you for asking. <laughs> no problem. All right. All right. Bye. Enjoy the afternoon. <laughs> you too. Bye-bye. Right.